times are short, and we must have an urgency to the call of the gospel. Peter had it in the first century. Paul lived every moment of his life that way, as if today was it, so what am I going to do today? How am I going to live for Jesus today? Now, it took a little bit of time. I mean, what we've talked about the first century church here in the book of Acts, especially the first seven chapters, were holed up in Jerusalem, happy in Jerusalem, comfortable in Jerusalem, figuring that they just had to wait and ultimately Jesus was going to come back. Well, it was a denial of a command he had given them to be his witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And so finally, because they weren't moving out, he moved them out. And it was the first time he would use Saul. He will use Saul in many other ways. And we began to look at the life of Saul, who becomes Paul, on Sunday morning. We're still going to leave Saul in the state he was in Sunday, blind and waiting for uh, some answers. But tonight we're going to go on and look at a little bit of Peter's ministry as he begins to step out. In fact, we're going to cover all of Peter's ministry in the book of Acts, with with the exception of an occurrence in chapter 12. So let's pick it up in verse 32 of chapter 9. As Peter was traveling through all those regions, he came down also to the saints who lived at Lydda. There he found a man named Aeneas, who had been bedridden eight years, for he was paralyzed. Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up and make your bed. And how many times did I hear my mom say that when I was growing up? (laughs) Rick, get up and make your bed. Immediately he got up. And all who lived at Lydda and Sharon saw him, and they turned to the Lord. So the gospel is now being tilled in Judea and Samaria. This region is Judea. It's Lydda, the town of Lydda, which is Lod today. You might know it better by Ben Gurion International Airport. That's Lydda. Ben Gurion International Airport today, where we fly into Israel when we travel to Israel. Did I tell you we're going to Israel in the spring? <laughs> If you'd like to go, please talk to me. We fly into Ben Gurion. That's Lida, Lod. Uh, the Sharon is that fertile coastal plain that runs from Haifa in the north all the way down to Mount Carmel. It's between the Mediterranean Sea and the mountains of Israel, the Sharon Valley. Very, very uh, fertile and rich fruits and vegetables at this time. And then there's Jaffa, which is also called Jaffa. It's also called Yafo. If you're in Israel, you see a sign, Y-A-F-O, actually in English letters, which is interesting to me, Yafo, Yafa, Jaffa, or we'll just say Jaffa because that's what our Greek Bibles are telling us. It's a seaport village, Jaffa, a brisk 40-minute walk south down along the shoreline from Tel Aviv. So it's all right here in this same area, this coastal seaside area of Israel, and Peter's down there and he's making his way around to these places. But more than the places, look at the people. Because Luke comes along and he calls them, note this in verse 32, the saints who lived at Lydda. That's the first time the word saints will be applied to the church. The saints who live at Lydda. It's not the first time it's used in the New Testament. It's actually used in Matthew 27, verses 52 and 53, which says the tombs were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they entered the holy city and appeared to many. I love that story. Do you realize what happened that in Jesus' resurrection, it was like a shockwave that went out from the tomb as Jesus resurrected and life sprung forth? And other dead people just couldn't stay dead. And started coming out of the tombs and walking down the streets of Jerusalem. Mom, I just saw Uncle Larry outside. Your Uncle Larry has been dead for there he goes. (laughs) And it happened. Who are these saints? The word is hagios. Get used to it. Hagios in the Greek, it means holy ones. And this first usage in the New Testament, in the Gospel of Matthew, speaks of the saints of Israel who had died prior to the crucifixion. In waiting now, but see, they're redeemed. 
Those who have died in faith in the Lord, now redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, can be called saints. They are holy ones, and so they come up out of the graves. But here in Lydda, for the first time, the church is referred to as the saints. And that is so important for you and I to understand. Because you don't have to wait for a nomination or a veneration or a beatification to be a saint. According to this book, you just got to be washed in the blood. To be a saint? It's what the Bible says. What Luther once called the priesthood of all believers is also the sainthood of all believers. My friends, look around. We are a room full of saints. A bit scruffy, maybe. But we are the Hagias. We who believe in Jesus, who have been washed by the blood of the Lamb, are saints. God's people. And now, throughout the New Testament, God's people are often referred to as Hagias. As the saints. And ultimately, any and all who put their faith in Jesus Christ make up the saints. Let me tell you, if you were unnerved a bit about what I shared, because what I shared during second service, if you haven't heard it, you can go back and listen. It's it's the last part of the teaching, about the last ten minutes. We talked about the rapture of the church and the imminency of that, and that perhaps because yesterday was Yom Teruah, the day of trumpets in Israel, Rosh Hashanah, the feast of trumpets, that there are those who believe, and I lean this direction, that because it's called that, that the last trumpet will sound perhaps on that day. Wow, we got a year till the next Yom Teruah. Be careful. Because we do not know the day or the hour. But I was sharing that on Sunday. And all the things that are happening right now in this season, and all the Jewish feasts and festivals and times that are converging this week, between now and September 28th, September 28th being Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles, and the final of the four blood moons and the blood moon tetrad. (laughs) That everybody's been watching, all excited about. And I went home on Sunday and I stopped for a moment and I thought, did I go too far? Because I don't really like to be about scaring people. Do you know what? Sometimes we need a little scaring. To get off of our rear ends and out of the door sharing the gospel. To be making amends with those with whom maybe we have conflict. To be showing the love of Christ as never before. Because I don't care if it's Yom Teruah or Sukkot or Shabbat or any other Hebrew festival or holiday. Or none of those at all. Jesus is coming soon. But here's the good news. And this is why we share the gospel. And it's why we live lives of faith. Because when he comes, the saints will go to Jesus. When he calls, the saints, according to scripture, will be caught up. What if I'm not packed? You're not going to have to take anything. (laughs) 1 Thessalonians 4.17 Yes, again Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so we will always be with the Lord But listen, saints Then we will be in for the ride of our lives In the rapture? No That's going to be too quick I mean, imagine an amusement park ride that was over in the blink of an eye Who would ride that? Stand in line for half hour. Done. Okay, next line. What? We're just going to be in his presence so fast. It's actually not even a blink. It's faster than a blink. It's a twinkle of an eye. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 52. But we're still in after that for the ride of our lives. Because you see, we come back with Jesus. Where do you get that? Well, saints, listen up. Revelation 19, verse 7, let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride, his bride, who's the bride? The church. The church. Marriage is a picture of Christ and the church. Always has been, which is, by the way, why marriage should be considered so holy. Which is, by the way, the real reason why I was personally so upset by our Supreme Court's unfortunate and wrong decision. Because the 
the picture of marriage is a picture of the church, Jesus and his bride. And Satan's trying to soil that, folks. Any way he can, if he can mess up the picture of marriage, he can mess up the picture of Christ in the church. But he says, let us give glory to him for the marriage of the Lamb has come. His bride has made herself ready. Well, how has she done that? It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints, the Hagios. But note, those righteous acts were given to her, not generated within her. It's not self-righteousness, it's God-righteousness. He has given us the very righteousness to do righteous things, which becomes then the very clothing of the bride, the fine linen. But listen to this, after this marriage feast of the bride, the bride has made herself ready, she's dressed in that fine linen, bright and clean, the righteous acts of the church, it's the saints, it's the church. And then, Revelation 19, 11, John says, I saw heaven open. And behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. Then in verse 14 he says, And the armies, the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Have you ever seen an army gear up for battle and put on a nice fine linen outfit? (laughs) that's what a priest wears that is not what a soldier wears and yet here's this army in fine linen white and clean following him on white horses what is the fine linen it is the righteous acts of the saints it is that which clothes the saints and so here comes Jesus in his second coming in his return and according to John in the revelation he sees all these people who just so happen to be the Hagios, the saints, returning with him. That's the right of our lives. Amen. Well, can you verify that a little more? Because, you know, Revelation, it's a book of metaphors and allegories. It's really hard to understand. Wrong. But yes, I can give you more. Jude 14, the very first prophecy written down in history, given by Enoch, just in the seventh generation from Adam. Adam was, by the way, still alive when Enoch gave this prophecy. Behold, the Lord came with many thousands of his hagias, holy ones, saints. Enoch gets a prophetic vision of the return of Jesus way back in the very beginning of what was going to happen in the very end when Jesus comes back and the saints return with him. And it is not based on your ability to do all this, it's just faith. Just trusting in Jesus. Do you love the Lord? Yeah. And is He your Lord tonight? Don't worry about it. When He calls, you'll go. But what about those friends and family of mine who don't know Jesus? Worry about them. Absolutely. Pray for them constantly. Go to them again and again as if they were drowning because, my friends, they are. They are. So Peter came down to the saints. And I took some time with saints because we're going to see that word a lot. Luke uses it a lot. It's always now speaking of the church, well, primarily of the church, the saints in Lydda. He heals this man named Aeneas of his lameness. Look again at verse 34. Peter saying to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up and make your bed. Peter understood something. That the name of Jesus strengthens legs. That healing has always been and will always be by the power of the name of Jesus. So he says Jesus Christ heals you, but I love that he says get up and make your bed. Use your legs, bro. Reminds me of Acts chapter 3 verse 6. When Peter was walking into the beautiful gate of the temple, he said, I do not possess silver or gold to the little man lying there. But what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, walk. Now listen, the world says to you, you've made your bed, now lie in it. Jesus Christ says, get up, make your bed, and lie in it no more. Don't wallow around, don't lie there sulking in your sin. Get up, make your bed, 
And what do you do once the bed's made? It's the most depressing moment of the day for me. You know? Times in the morning, well, I'll, I'll get up and I'll go get a glass of water and I'll come back into the room and Cheryl's already got the bed made and it's like, oh. <laughs> Honey, it's Saturday. Why do you make the bed? Because you're not getting back in. Bed's made. Get on the move. Now it's time to walk. Hebrews 12, 12 says, Strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble and make straight paths for your feet so that the limb which is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. And what happens then? What happens when we, the saints, the church, make our beds and no longer lie in them? What happens is verse 35, All who lived at Lydda and Sharon saw him and they turned to the Lord. Because word's getting out. Because people aren't going back to bed. They're not napping when they ought to be sharing the gospel of Christ. And by the way, Aeneas, his name means praiseworthy. So here this man whose name means praiseworthy is walking. And that's what happens when one walks in the name of Jesus. We become saints unto his praise. Saints unto his praise. It's not the old Irish. Sure to be God are the saints be praised. It's not the saints be praised. It's the saints be praising. Sure and by God, the saints be praising God. And I'll tell you something. Praising the Lord is not just standing up and lifting hands in worship on a Sunday or a Wednesday. And praising the Lord is not just singing at the top of your lungs in your car as you drive down 20 and people think you're weird. You praise the Lord every single time you speak the name of Jesus to someone who's lost. Do you realize that? You are worshiping Jesus every time you offer His name. Every time you share Him, you are praising the Lord. You are doing the most praiseworthy thing a follower of Jesus can possibly do. So the gospel's going out. Verse 36. Now in Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha, which translated in Greek is called Dorcas, which is why she went by Tabitha. (laughs) By the way, Tabitha's name means gazelle. So does Dorcas. So you can always just call her gazelle. And this woman was abounding with deeds of kindness and charity, which she continually did. And it happened at that time that she fell sick and died. And when they had washed her body and laid it in an upper room, uh, since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples, having heard that Peter was there, sent two men to him, imploring him, Do not delay in coming to us. Now, wait a minute. She's dead. Why are you bothering Peter? You know what? Somebody's got some faith here, gang. They would not have sent for Peter if they didn't have some sense that perhaps... He could do something about this situation. And it's the kind of faith so often Christians have. We don't really know what he can do because resurrection is pretty astounding, pretty awesome. We know Jesus did. Not only did he himself resurrect, but he also resurrected other people. We know it's, it's possible by the power of the name of Jesus. We know that we've heard that things have been going on in Jerusalem. That even Peter's shadow seemed to bear the power of Christ healing people. So, I don't know. This is tragic. We're sad. We're mourning. But Peter's just down the road. Go get him. So they do. Verse 39. So Peter arose and went with them. When he arrived, they brought him into the upper room and all the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing all the tunics and garments that Dorcas used to make while she was with them. See, she's dead now so they can call her Dorcas. (laughs) <laughs> Sorry. But, Pe- but Peter sent them all out and he knelt down and prayed. Now, wait a minute. Do you think as Peter prayed that his thoughts drifted back to another room in a synagogue leader's house in Capernaum where he stood watching alone? As Jesus had put out all the mourners and led Peter and John and James and the mother and father, just that little group, into the bedroom where this little girl lay dead. And as Peter's praying, I can't 
I can't imagine that he didn't drift back to that and think about it. Where Jesus said in Mark 5, 41, after taking the child by the hand, Talitha kum. Talitha kum, which translated means, little girl, I say to you, get up. You see, Jesus was training Peter, James, and John and the other apostles with every single thing he did, with every single thing he taught. He was showing them, this is what you're going to do. Now, they may not have understood it at the time, but in the synagogue leader's home in Capernaum, he was training Peter for this moment. And in this moment, Peter, he kneels down. First thing he does is he prays. And then, turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And he doesn't call her Dorcas. Now, honestly, seriously, I think, I wonder, that perhaps he said, Tabitha, arise, because Tabitha sounds so much like Talitha. And Talitha Kum, little girl, arise, is on his mind. And here's Tabitha, and so he, he says to her, Tabitha, arise, she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. Verse 41, he gave her his hand and he raised her up. And calling the saints, there they are, the Hagias, the holy ones, and the widows, he presented her alive. Now, it's not just about wordplay. that I, I'm not just pointing that out because it's a wordplay, Tabitha, Talitha. My point is this, Peter's imitation of Christ. Peter is now just doing what he had seen. He is imitating what he had experienced in Jesus. He is replicating prior miracles that Jesus had done, now doing the same thing in the name of Jesus, because discipleship is not just learning about Jesus. Discipleship is emulating Jesus. It's doing Jesus in your life. It's acting as Jesus acted. It's taking his example and saying, well, Jesus did this. So I'm going to do the same thing he did. I'm going to act the same way he acted. I'm going to pattern my life after him. That's discipleship. That's where the pupil becomes like the teacher. It's not just sitting and learning. Sitting and learning is fine. But true discipleship is acted out by imitating Christ Jesus. By the way, as Peter prays here, one thing I can tell you he didn't pray. He didn't appeal to Tabitha's kindness or goodness for her resurrection. Oh Lord, she was such a good woman. Look at the clothing that they show me that she made. She's vital to this fellowship and they need her. Oh Lord, please send her back because, because Tabitha was one of the good ones. No. It is never the goodness of another person to which we appeal. It is always the grace of God. And I've heard this often, and I think I've shared this before, that oftentimes we find ourselves praying for someone, and we do that. We go to their goodness, as if we need to make a case to the Lord in prayer. Father, what do we do without her? She was so vital to what's going on here, to the things. She was in charge of the entire knitting ministry. Where's that going to go? <laughs> He was vital to the church. Now he's gone. He was stalwart in our family. Lord, bring him back because he was a righteous man. No. Bring him back because of the righteousness of the blood of Jesus. Lord, heal because you are gracious. Because you are good. And I think our prayers need to shift a bit in the church to appealing to the goodness of God rather than to the goodness of the sick person. Good or bad, that's not the point. It's His grace. That's the point. Back in Acts chapter 4, verse 30, all the saints, they all were praying together and they said, Extend your hand to heal. And signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant Jesus. For the first century church, early on, it was all about Jesus. Their prayers, their worship, their healings, their ministry. Their acts of kindness and goodness. It was all for the sake of the name of Jesus. And we appeal to the grace of God. Verse 42. So it became known all over Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. And Peter stayed many days in Joppa with a tanner named Simon. Now before we go on to chapter 10, 
few things to know about Jaffa. It's a, it's a really quaint little seaport today. It's been revitalized. It's been kind of rebuilt some of the ruins and some of the areas that were not in such good shape prior to Israel coming back and the land have been, have been restored. It juts out into the Mediterranean. As I said, it's about a 40-minute walk around the curve of the, of the ocean, of the shoreline from Tel Aviv. So you can stand at the pinnacle, and it kind of, it's like on a little hill there. You can stand at the pinnacle of Jaffa and look across to Tel Aviv, and it's just beautiful. It's primarily an artist colony today. There are those who think that perhaps Jaffa comes from the name Japheth, because when Shem, Ham, and Japheth, the three sons of Noah, climbed off of the ark, Ham went south into the African area, and Shem remained mostly in the Middle East and, and to the east, and Japheth went west. Japheth was a seafarer. And so it makes sense that perhaps he came to this little outcropping, this natural harbor there on the coast of Israel, and constructed the city of Jaffa, named after Japheth. We don't know for sure. But it has two tags in it today, two little tags that if you were to go to Jaffa, you would see that speak of two important moments in its history. The first tag is a sculpture of a big fish. It's down in the southern end of the town. Uh, tourists often grab photos of themselves sitting on or around the fish. Several of you have done that on recent trips to Israel. And it's a statue that reminds us that from this port, a pugnacious prophet purchased passage heading in the opposite direction of God's call. It was from Jaffa, Jaffa, that Jonah sailed to Tarshish, or at least in the direction of Tarshish. He would never arrive there. He became a fish lunch. <laughs> you know the story of Jonah. What's interesting is Jonah was supposed to go to the Gentiles of Nineveh, but rather he went to Jaffa and headed out in the opposite direction. And by the way, if you think it's just a fish story, if you find the whole story of Jonah hard to swallow, <laughs> you will need to take it up with Jesus because he did not teach it as a metaphor. He did not teach it as an allegorical tale. No, he said, just as Jonah, Matthew 12, verse 40, was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Just as Jonah was in the fish, so I will be in the tomb. He says, the men of Nineveh will stand up with this generation at the judgment and will condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. So if you are one who says, well, I don't believe the story of Jonah, then you don't believe Jesus because he does. And he taught it. And so Joppa has that historical tag, the fish, Jonah, the story of Jonah. But there's one more. And it's one that you might miss if someone didn't point it out to you. If you're walking down the quaint little cobblestone streets of Joppa and you come to a, a door, like any other door along the street, you would see a sign, a little sign, a hand-painted sign that reads, The Home of Simon the Tanner. And the sign is still there. What, from Simon the Tanner? Did he paint that? No, no. But, but there's a sign on a door in Jaffa that says the home of Simon the Tanner. It's a home that is owned by the Zakarian family. They have owned this home for generations, and they have very good evidence to support the notion that that house belonged to Simon the Tanner. Right there, still, in Jaffa today. Simon the Tanner... Which means a couple of things. It means the home would have stunk to high heaven. He was a tanner. He worked on the hides of dead animals. That was Simon's job. You know what that job was in ancient Israel? Unclean. Tanners were not allowed to even live in the city limits in most places. Well, I guess Java being a seaport town, they, you know, they were a little looser with that. Most cities would make the tanner live outside of town. The stench and the uncleanness of the job. If a woman was married to a man by rabbinical law and he decided to become a tanner, she had the right to divorce him. And this was Peter's bud, Peter's pal, Simon the Tanner. 
And ironically, it is from the rooftop of Simon the Tanner where Peter is awaiting lunch and praying that he says, Lord, I've never eaten anything unholy or unclean. You know whose house you're residing in, don't you, Pete? Simon the Tanner. But you know what? Ever since the veil was torn, walls were coming down. Things that were once unclean suddenly are not appearing as so unclean anymore. And a greater wall is about to fall, in fact, 40 miles now north of Joppa, in a magnificent Herodian seaport called Caesarea. A Gentile was praying. Chapter 10, verse 1. Now there was a man at Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian cohort, a devout man and one who feared God with all his household and gave many alms to the Jewish people and prayed to God continually. About the ninth hour of the day, or 3 p.m., he clearly saw in a vision an angel of God who had just come in and said to him, Cornelius, and fixing his gaze on him, which I think could be translated and caught like a deer in the headlights, and being much alarmed, he said... What is it, Lord? And he said to him, Your prayers and alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Now, don't worry that he called the angel Lord. He's not worshiping him there. The word is curious and could also mean sir. It also could just be a statement of, you know, kind of honor. Your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Now, dispatch some men to Joppa and send... For a man named Simon, who is also called Peter. He is staying with a tanner named Simon, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who was speaking to him had left, he summoned two of his servants and a devout soldier of those who were his personal attendants. And after he had explained to them everything, he sent them to Joppa. I would love to be a fly on the wall. Thank you. Yeah. I'd love to be a fly on the wall in the conversation of the three men having been sent by Cornelius to Joppa. Is he nuts? Did you? He said an angel. Ooh, was it really? Do you think? This is, well, it's a day off, so we'll, you know, we'll trudge on down to Joppa and see what happens. They get there, and there's a house. A little sign on the door. The house of Simon the Tanner. Knock, knock, knock. There's Simon the Tanner. They can tell. <laughs> and Peter's up on the roof. A legion. This man of Caesarea named Cornelius was a centurion. A Roman legion was 6,000 men. A cohort, like the cohort, the Italian cohort there stationed in Caesarea, would be a group of 600 men. In a cohort of 600, you would have six centurions, for a centurion was over 100 men. Or or a centuria. And that was kind of the breakdown of the Roman army. There's far more to it. It was very well organized. But you had your legion. You had your cohorts within the legion. And then you had your centuria within the cohorts within the legion. And a centurion was in charge of a 100 men in a cohort. And the centurions truly were seen and known as the backbone of the royal army. I mean, these guys were some of the most highly trusted because you're talking about, from the higher up generals and commanders, you're talking about the guys who really got it done. The guys who would lead a hundred men into battle this way or that way, or six of them who would command a cohort on the field. The Roman centurions were the go-to guys of the Roman army. Highly disciplined men. Fiercely loyal And very honorable. In fact, it's interesting, every time we see a centurion in the New Testament, they are spoken of favorably. We see the centurion who came to see Jesus. Remember that story? Back in Matthew chapter 8, verse 8. He has a servant, a beloved servant who's sick, and he he comes to tell Jesus, and Jesus says, well, let's go. And he says, no, 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 I'm, I'm not worthy for you to come under my roof. But just say the word. And my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority, the soldiers under me. I say to this one, go. And and he goes, and to another, come. And he comes, and to my slave, do this. And he does this. And Jesus marveled and said, truly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith in all Israel. Here's this centurion commander in the Roman army, and he goes, I get it. I get it. You have the authority to do whatever you want. All you got to do is say the word, and my servant will be healed. 
A centurion. It was a centurion at the cross of Jesus who, when he saw all that took place there on the cross, Matthew 27, 54 said, truly, this was the Son of God. And here we see another disciplined, devout, God-fearing centurion in Cornelius. A man who loves Israel. He gives alms, that is, offerings, gifts of money, finances, supports the people of Israel. He prays to the God of Israel. And my friends, he's utterly lost. We need to understand that. For all his goodness, for all his giving, for all his praying, for all his fearing the Lord, and he did, he was still lost. All those things weren't enough because all those things don't buy salvation. And so he's praying. So let me ask you this. Does God hear the prayers of sinners? Of course he does. Oh, I don't think the silly prayers. Lord, get me that car, get me that girl, get me that home, get me that job. I don't think those prayers go anywhere. For someone who doesn't even have faith in the Lord. But the heartfelt prayer of a sinner who's crying out to God, show me the way. Show me the truth. Show me the life. Yeah. I think God hears their prayers. Well, we know He heard Cornelius. Proverbs 15.29 says, The Lord is far from the wicked, but He hears the prayer of the righteous. And I have to sip this water because Cheryl got it for me. He hears the prayer of the righteous. Hey, listen, Cornelius maybe not was was not inherently righteous, but he was seeking righteousness. He was seeking God. And so the angel told Cornelius, and this is important, he said, your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. A memorial, what does that mean? In the Greek, it's literally a remembrance. What you've done, what you're doing, where you're trying to get, God remembers. God has heard you. It's kind of like iPhone alerts. Have any of you gotten to the point now, if you didn't have alerts on your iPhones, you wouldn't know what to do with yourself? <laughs> See, I'm there. My iPhone alert goes off. It goes two, off two days before, one day before, two hours before, and a half hour before, and I'm still late sometimes. <laughs> but I know, and the alerts remind me of what's important, remind me of what I need to do. And according to the story of Cornelius, prayers and offerings are like iPhone alerts to the Lord. They keep the person who is praying, the person who is offering, they keep that person in the remembrance of God. Oh, no, he doesn't forget people. It's not that he blanks out on you. But I do think there's a principle here that those who are most constant in prayer, those who are fervent in the word, faithful in their giving, tend to be the ones who most often come to the remembrance of the Lord. And Jesus encouraged this highly. Let me read this to you. This is Luke chapter 11, verse 5, where Jesus says, Suppose one of you has a friend and goes to him at midnight and says to him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has come to me from a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And from inside he answers and says, Do not bother me. The door has already been shut, and my children and I are in bed. The bed is not made. (laughs) I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, Jesus says, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he's his friend, yet because of his persistence, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. And of course, Jesus is calling for persistence in our prayer, persistence in our approach to God. And he says this, and you know this well, many of you. So I say to you, keep asking. And it will be given to you. Keep seeking and you will find. Keep knocking and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds and he who knocks it will be opened. Now suppose one of you fathers is asked by his son for a fish. He will not give him a snake instead of a fish, will he? If he's asked for an egg, he will not give him a scorpion, will he? If you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Cornelius is asking and God is about to give. And he's about to give that very gift. What gift? The Holy Spirit. So 
So Cornelius sends his men south to Joppa, where they meet up with a slightly less pugnacious prophet than Jonah, named Peter, who's praying at the time. Verse 9, on the next day, as they were on their way and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. Wait a minute. This is not real effective management, Lord, if I may be so brash. You send an angel to Cornelius to tell Cornelius to send some men to Peter so that Peter can come back and talk to Cornelius about Jesus. Why not just have the angel tell him? I mean, wouldn't you think that would be more effective anyway? I, Gabriel, am here to tell you about Jesus the Christ. And he's on his face and he's <laughs> believes right there. But there's this whole four-day process of involving Peter. And that's the point. It wasn't the angel's job. And you realize that now in the same age in which Peter was at the beginning, that we are at the end in this church age, it is not the job of angels to preach the gospel. It's your job. And it's my job. And Jesus invites us into a partnership of the gospel. Philippians 1.3, Paul writes, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all in view of your participation, your koinonia, your fellowship, your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Hey, the preaching of the gospel is a partnership. And we are all in. And it is not the job of angels. And it is not just the job of pastors. And it is not just the job of evangelists. It's the job of actual people who are called to tell about Jesus. Proverbs 11.30 tells us the fruit of righteousness, or the fruit of the righteous, is a tree of life. And he who is wise wins souls. You want to be wise? Be a soul winner. Daniel chapter 12 verse 3 says, Those who lead the many to righteousness will shine like stars forever and ever. Shining soul winners. So, question. Who was the last person with whom you shared the gospel? Who's the last person you told? Or when was the last time that you sat down with someone and said, Can I tell you about Jesus? It's a fair question. I know it's a guilt tripping question. I get it. I'm a pastor. I do this thing. No, I really do. I understand it. I've heard it all my life. When was the last time that you told someone about Jesus, you know? Well, if we really believe, and I do, that we're at the last of the last days, isn't that a question we ought to be thinking about every day? When was the last time? Who's the last person I told about Jesus? And how many people in between then and now have I skipped by because I was uncomfortable or I was a little I was a little nervous or I was afraid I might offend or I wasn't sure what to say? Excuses, 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 excuses. Who was the last person that you told about Jesus? If you want to be wise, if you want to shine, be a soul winner. Well, verse 10. So Peter's up on the top of the housetop and he's praying, but he became hungry. This is the greatest story. And he was desiring to eat. But while they were making preparations, he fell into a trance. And he saw the sky opened up and an object like a great sheet coming down, lowered by four corners to the ground. And there were in it all kinds of four-footed animals and crawling creatures of the earth and birds of the air. And a voice came to him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I've never eaten anything unholy and unclean. And again, a voice came to him a second time, What God has cleansed, no longer consider unholy or common. This happened three times, and immediately the object was taken up in two the sky. <laughs> Peter uses strong words that don't translate well into the English when he responds to the Lord. When he says, by no means, Lord, it's stronger than that. No way! 
Not going to do it. Uh-uh. And thanks for playing. He is, he is turning around and he's saying to the Lord, no. Kind of like you did on the, on the uh, night of the Last Supper. You shall never wash my, my hands and my, my, my feet. Peter had a way of saying no to the Lord. We talked about this in staff meeting this morning. Isn't that kind of an oxymoron? By no means. Lord? If he's Lord, do you have the right to say by no means? Absolutely not. The Lord says, rise, Peter, kill and eat. I'm giving you a command. Uh Uh-oh, I'm not going to do it. Nope. Sorry. And far too many believers consider Jesus their glorious, gracious Savior, but don't go to the Lordship aspect of the relationship. He is Lord. He is Lord. If the church today absolutely accepted the Lordship of Christ, then this word would be the standard over all the laws of men. And we would not cave on it. By no means, Lord, he said. This is the third time, actually, that he refuses the will of God in his illustrious, pugnacious career. Matthew 16, 23, he took Jesus aside and actually started to rebuke him, saying, God forbid, Lord, this shall never happen to you. Remember what Jesus said? Get behind me, Satan. And he wasn't kidding around. You're not setting your mind on God's interests, but on man's. And when we try to call Jesus Lord, but refuse to do what he wants us to do, that's what's happening. We're setting on our interests on man's interests and not on God's. Peter said to him, never shall you wash my feet. He said, if I do not wash you, you have no part of me. And here now the third time, by no means, Lord. But think about what he saw. Lord from heaven, this by, by four corners, this linen sheet. Now some have looked at this and said, oh, I know what that is. It's a sail. It's a great linen sail. But God is doing what Jesus always did when he told the parables. He's using something that would be familiar. They're in a seaport town. Therefore, it's a big white sail that all these animals are flopping around in. That's possible. Some say, well, no, it's representative because it's dropped held down by four corners of the four corners of the earth. North, south, east, west. Maybe. Listen to the King James translation of the same verse. Interesting. He saw a heaven opened, Acts 10, 11, and a certain vessel, that is the sheet, was descending unto him as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth. You see it? I think what Peter saw was a talit, a Hebrew prayer shawl, knit at the four corners with the zitzit, those tassels, that are on the Hebrew prayer shawl. Now, if that is the case, and I, I can't say absolutely, but in my opinion, the four corners, knit on the four corners, being lowered, now you have a prayer shawl filled with unclean animals. Can you see why Peter was a little upset? Why he said, by no means, what is this? What kind of vision are you giving me? Now, I've heard it said there's a place for all God's creatures right next to the mashed potatoes. <laughs> but it's not a wonder here that Peter was incredulous. The Lord has to repeat this vision three times simply to get it through Peter's thick skull. And you know what? No offense to Peter, because he often has to do things far more than three times to get it through my head. How many times? Does God have to say something to you before you get it? Before you receive it? Well, verse 17, he has seen this. And now while Peter was greatly perplexed in mind as to what the vision which he had seen might be, behold, the men who had been sent by Cornelius, having asked directions for Simon's house, appeared at the gate. And calling out, they asked whether Simon, who was called Peter, was staying there. While Peter was reflecting on the vision, the, Peter, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. But get up, go downstairs and accompany them without misgivings, for I sent them myself. 
Peter went down to the men and said, Behold, I am the one you are looking for. What is the reason for which you have come? Now, just did you see that Peter is so cool? Because Peter is just so authentic. He's just a real guy. In one moment, he's saying, by no means, Lord. In the next moment, he's given instructions by the Lord, and he's walking it out. He trusts the Lord. He believes in what he's hearing. He, he is a man of God. He's just raised a, guy's, uh, a lame guy to walk. He just raised a woman from the dead. This same Peter, who said, by no means. So have, have a little, I don't know, have a little compassion for your own self when you mess up, saints. None of us are perfect. We're just following. We're just being, as we talked about Sunday, transformed. So Peter goes down. He says, why have you come? Verse 22. They said, Cornelius, the centurion, a righteous and God-fearing man, well spoken of by the entire nation of the Jews, was directed, divinely is added in there because he was directed by a, a holy angel, to send for you to come to this house and hear a message from you. So he invited them in and gave them lodging. So now these three guys are starting to believe. They, told, they were told something by their boss, who obviously is a little stressed and off kilter to have a vision like this, and now they're seeing it come true. So now they're starting to have a little bit of faith. And on the next day, he got up and went away with them, and some of the brethren from Joppa accompanied him. No doubt some wanted to see what is about to happen. What God has cleansed, no longer consider Unholy. That's what the Lord said to Peter. And the word unholy there is also common. As we head to Caesarea, understand that God is about to do something huge. But don't do that. Don't consider what God has cleansed as common. And I'm coming right back to the issue of saints. If you are a saint of the Lord, you are not common. You are not unholy. You're a holy one. Recognize that. Accept that. We Gentiles are no longer unclean. Revelation 19, 8, it was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the Hagias. We are a cleansed people by Jesus. And God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. We know that now. We're looking back. Peter's on the other side looking forward and no Gentile is clean. And at this point, no Gentile was in the church, at least that he knew of. Philip had already, you know, gotten in touch with the Ethiopian, but I'm not sure if that word had gotten back to Peter yet. So now Peter is heading with this guy. He's trying to figure all this out, thinking it through. He got up, he accompanied them, and some of the brethren from Joppa, they came to, verse 24, and the following day he entered Caesarea. Now, Cornelius was waiting for him, and he called together his relatives and close friends. Okay, here's an unsaved guy who already wants to see all his relatives and close friends saved. Who wants all of those who matter to him to hear the same message that he is longing to hear. He's already got them gathered together. When Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet and worshipped. <laughs> but Peter raised him up saying, stand up. I too am a man. As he talked with him, he entered and found many people assembled. And he said to them, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a man who is a Jew to associate with a foreigner or to visit him. And, and yet God has shown me that I should not call any man unholy or unclean. Peter, authentic Peter, is thinking out loud. He's figuring this out as he goes. And here he's in a room full of Gentiles, and he's going, okay, I can't dismiss the vision the Lord gave me, the vision the Lord gave Cornelius. He caused this to happen. He's called this meeting. So Peter's talking out loud here. And note what he says in verse 29. That is why I came without even raising any objection when I was sent for. Really? I recall him saying, by no means, Lord. I think there was some objection there. Of course, when he was finally called for, he, he went. So I asked for what reason you have sent me. Now, he's slightly less pugnacious than Jonah because Jonah didn't want to go at all to Nineveh. Peter is 
willing to go, but understand what's happening here. God is working on both sides of the equation. Okay? He's responding to the prayer of the Gentile and working on Cornelius and his family and his friends. And he's teaching the church how to open the doors a little wider. He's teaching the Jewish church that this is bigger than Jerusalem. It's bigger than Judea. It's bigger than Samaria. It is about the uttermost parts of the earth. Peter's going to take a little time to get used to this. The transformation of this man is going to take some time. In fact, ironically, it will be the Apostle Paul who ultimately calls Peter out on this. Galatians 2.14, Paul says, When I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, Peter, in the presence of all, If you, being a Jew, live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews, how is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? Hypocrite? Paul calls out Peter later on in his life because transformation is a lifelong thing. And that's why I love Peter so much. He reminds me of that and often. Verse 30, Cornelius said, Four days ago to this hour, I was praying in my house during the ninth hour, and behold, a man stood before me in shining garments. And he said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard, and your alms have been remembered before God. Therefore, I sent to Joppa to invite Simon, who is also called Peter, to come to you. He is staying at the house of Simon the Tanner by the sea. So I sent for you immediately, and you have been kind enough to come. Now then, we are all here, present before God, to hear all, listen, to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. See, the centurion understands commands. And he says to Peter, we want to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord to tell us. This is what I call an open house. All right, Peter's standing there. I mean, how often do you get the chance to preach the gospel to an entire household of people who are begging you to preach the gospel? Here in America, it seems like it's the other way around. We have to beg someone to listen to the gospel. But in this case, they're all just ready to hear. Tell us, what's the deal? We want to know. Cornelius is beside himself. And he got it exactly right. The sharing of the gospel. Please get this tonight. The sharing of the gospel is a command of the Lord. And if he is your Lord, we must preach the gospel. So tell us what he's commanded you to tell us. Verse 34, opening his mouth, Peter said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality, but in every nation, the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. The word which he sent to the sons of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all, you yourselves know, oh wait a minute, wait a minute, stop right there. The word which he sent to the sons of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ. Peace. Hey, Peter doesn't even realize the peace that is being offered right then. In that very moment, the peace that was taking place before his very eyes. What do you mean? Paul later wrote in Ephesians 2.13, Now in Christ Jesus, you Gentiles, who were formerly far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who made both groups, Jews, and Gentiles into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace. You know, one problem with the Hebrew law, it was for the Jewish people. It was not for the Gentiles. And so for the Gentiles, they were always going to be outsiders to this, to this amazing, perfect law of God given only to Israel. To the Jewish people, we got the law. And you don't. And so there was enmity. There was division. Tragically, there's still division. There should not be. Not in Jesus, between Jew and Gentile. And I will say this very clearly to you all. Any church... Any church opposing Israel is in all truth at odds with God himself and with the peace of Christ Jesus. 
That's called replacement theology, and it is of the devil. It is not of the Word of God. Verse 37. You yourselves know the thing, he continues on, which took place throughout all Judea, starting from Galilee, after the baptism which John proclaimed. You know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses of all the things he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They also put him to death by hanging him on a cross. Peter Peter here very boldly declares the Gentile form of Jesus' execution. He states it right up front. And this is fascinating to me because Peter in his preaching, as he talks to Cornelius, doesn't refer to a single passage of Hebrew Scripture. This is the first sermon he's done that. Every other sermon he's been drawing in, the Hebrew prophet said this, and the prophet said that, and the guy said this, and he's been quoting Scripture, and he does it one time here. All he does is give his testimony. He gives his witness of Jesus, of who Jesus is, of what Jesus did, of how Jesus died. Peter is just preaching Jesus. Verse 40. God raised him up on the third day and granted that he become visible, not to all people, but to witnesses who were chosen beforehand by God. That is, to us, who ate and drank with him. Obviously, that really impacted Peter. And he arose from the dead. Verse 42, and he ordered us to preach to the people and solemnly to testify that this is the one who has been anointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. Of him, all the prophets bear witness that through his name, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. Now watch this. It's so cool. Peter, sounds like now he's gearing up to launch into the prophets. Okay, because now all of a sudden he just mentioned them. All the prophets bear witness. And I can almost see Peter in this moment going, (gasps) ready to launch. Here comes the prophecies. Here comes the Jewish mentality. Here comes all the proofs from Hebrew scripture. And all of a sudden, God supernaturally interrupts him. God cuts in. And before we see what God does, God did that on the Mount of Transfiguration too, didn't he? Interrupted Peter. I have a feeling it was not difficult to interrupt Peter. Because he probably did a lot of talking. And so the only way you could stop him was to interrupt. Matthew 17, 4, Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. They're up on the mount. He sees Jesus transfigured in Elijah and Moses there beside him. And he says, if you wish, I will make three tabernacles here. One for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. And while he was still speaking... The bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. God interrupted Peter. This time, Peter is preaching Jesus, but God knows when Peter has said enough. And suddenly, verse 44, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon those who were listening to the message. And all the circumcised believers who came with Peter were amazed because the gift, singular, the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. Now, hold it right there. The gift of the Spirit, not the gifts, but the gift. What's the difference? What these circumcised believers, these Jewish believers recognized was that these people suddenly had the indwelling Holy Spirit of God. They realized the Spirit had been given. The Spirit, the seal of salvation. The Spirit, the anointing of God is now on Gentiles. They see this with their own own eyes. And remember that the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Spirit, you must have the gift before you can have the gifts. Because if you don't have the gift of the Spirit, you don't have any ability or power to operate the gifts of the Spirit. So He's present first. And He empowers second. And we're told then... Verse 46, they were hearing them speaking with tongues and exalting God. And a couple of things to note, no one had to teach them how to speak in tongues. I've had people, friends, tell me, well, here's how you do it. This is the way you learn. 
you begin by babbling, and eventually it will become a language. There's no scriptural back, backing for that. I do not deny, please understand, I do not deny the gift of tongues. But if the Lord is going to give you the gift of tongues, see, I'm, this is where Rick gets really simple-minded. If it's really of the Lord, it's going to happen. If he's going to give it, he's going to give it. And if you have a prayer language, it's because the Lord has given it to you. If you sing in the Spirit, it's because the Lord has given it to you to do that. But no one told them how. They just suddenly were speaking in tongues. The Spirit moved. And it came upon this entire house for a couple of reasons. Number one, because though their faith wasn't even yet voiced, as Peter spoke the word, faith welled up inside of them and God saw it. God knew there was faith there. They hadn't spoken it. Not a one of them had said, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. No, they're just listening as Peter's telling. And one by one, all these people are going in their hearts. Yes, yes, I believe this. Yes, this is true. And God goes, good enough for me. Bam. And the Holy Spirit is poured out. Lock, stock, and barrel over all of the Gentiles gathered there in the house. As they, listen, as they heard the word, they believed. And so the Spirit showed up. As they heard the word, they believed. But the second thing is as the circumcised believers heard their tongues, they received. That is, they received these people as family. They saw this happen. And there was no other possible reason but that God had accepted them. They understood now for the first time in the church, these God-appointed, Christ-redeemed, Spirit-filled Gentiles were family. That's why they were amazed. What was the proof that they had the gift of the Spirit dwelling within them? What was the proof? Again, verse 46 That they were hearing them speaking with tongues and exalting God. And that is it. The proof was in the praise. Instant worship. It's Pentecost 2.0. It's exactly what happened on Pentecost 1.0. You realize that? But now in Pentecost 2.0, the only difference is it's Gentiles who are speaking in tongues. But think back to the first, to the actual Pentecost, the day of the opening of the church, when it was all the apostles and the believers there who now are speaking in tongues. What were they saying? The Bible tells us they were worshiping. They were pouring out praise. All the tongues that they were speaking and heard by all of the people there in their various languages and dialects, what they heard was people worshiping God. Acts 2.11. They were speaking of the mighty deeds of God. They were praising God. They were worshiping. And here these people are doing the same thing. Suddenly the Spirit falls on them. They're speaking in tongues, but the tongues that they're speaking are tongues of worship. Tongues of praise. And that is instructive. Because in the Scriptures, tongues are always for the purpose of magnifying God. Tongues are never for the purpose of magnifying self. Rick, you really believe that speaking in tongues is still available in the church today? I absolutely do. For the worship and the glorification of Jesus Christ. Not for the, hey, looky here, listen to me, that we see too often in churches. It's not about you. It is about the Lord. Tongues are always Godward, never manward. Tongues are always about worship, never about the weather. What do you mean? I mean, it's not about forecasting. And there are those who will slip into tongues, so called, so acted, I think, sometimes, and they will start acting as though they're speaking in tongues and then give a word from the Lord that is a prophetic word proven by the fact that they were speaking in tongues. Well, speaking in tongues are not about the weather. They're about worship. So you're mixing your gifts. It's funny. I was thinking about the weather forecast earlier this week. On Monday, I looked at the forecast for the next 10 days and realized if the Lord came and got us on Tuesday, the forecast was irrelevant. 
And I almost decided to stop looking at the forecast, although I looked this morning. But it's not about forecasting. It's about worshiping. And Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14, 2, One who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. For no one understands, but in his spirit he speaks mysteries. And if tongues are Godward, if they are for the worship and the praise of Jesus, then they are not to be about drawing attention to one's own personal spirituality. There are many people in the Bridge Fellowship who speak in tongues. You might not even know that. You may not have ever heard them. Why? Because... There's a legitimacy there. They're not going to elevate themselves before the body. That's not what it's about. It's about worship. Well, let's finish. So, they heard them, and Peter answered, verse 47, Surely no one can refuse the water for these to be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we did, can he? And we don't know who Shirley was, but she apparently was there. (laughs) And he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and then they asked him to stay on for a few days. Isn't water baptism at this point superfluous? I mean, if there's ever a time in the scriptures where you would think someone doesn't need to get baptized, it's at Cornelius' house. Because they're already filled with the Holy Spirit. They're already... Praising God in tongues, they've already obviously accepted Jesus through faith in his name as they listen to the teachings of Peter. Why in the world should they get baptized at this point? It doesn't make sense. And this is now the fifth example of belief, water baptism, and baptism of the Spirit that we've seen in the book of Acts. We saw it at Pentecost. We saw it with the Samaritans. We saw it with the Ethiopian. We saw it with Saul. And now we see it with the household of Cornelius. Five examples. And I just need to point this out. Every single example is completely different. Except that it involves all the same elements. Everyone believes in Jesus. Everyone gets baptized in water. Everyone gets the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They just don't seem to do it in the same order. I thank God for that. Because you know what we would do if they were all in the same order? We would immediately legalize it. Oh, oh wait. You you were baptized in the Holy Spirit before you were baptized in water? I'm sorry, that's invalid, illegitimate. You are not a Christian. The Lord doesn't do it that way. All the elements are there, but the sequence changes. And this is the deal. We'll finish on this thought, but please hear this. It is not the order of things that concerns the Father as much as the obedience to those things. And so often in our lives, we worry about getting things out of order. Look, just obey the Lord. Because obviously, apparently, by His will, some people needed to be baptized with the Holy Spirit before they got baptized with water. They needed it, and Peter and the, and the gang from Joppa needed to see it so that they could be accepted and released to be baptized in water. Other people needed to be baptized in water before they received the Holy Spirit. Others needed to make the declaration of faith clearly and loudly before they were baptized in water and or baptized in the Spirit. It really depends on the person, and God is working independently and individually and uniquely. All the elements are there, but the issue is obedience. Obedience to the word of God. Acts chapter 2 verse 41 says those who had received his word were baptized. And among believers who had been baptized like Peter, like Peter, they were still learning how to lay aside personal biases. That's what's happening for Peter in the church here. Lay aside the personal biases. The walls are coming down. Lay aside the objections. By all means, Lord. In favor of simple obedience to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And Father, it is to your Lordship that we do appeal tonight. It is to your Lordship that we bow. It is faithfulness to your word that we desire and we seek. In Jesus' name, amen.